reminder, the 29th will be the harvest dinner. Stefan and his wife will be here. Miriam will be here. And uh, we'll have uh, a lot of goodies that um, we'll see what we're going to do. Let's do our verses together. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and if any bounds and mercies, will you might enjoy, to be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. But nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in holiness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let, Let this mind be in you, which is also Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus who, being who being in the form of God, not of God, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, things on the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All right, let's take our hymnals or look up on the screen, and we'll sing joyful, joyful to the Lord
my fortress, my God, in whom will I trust? Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. He sh shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust his truth, shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up with their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the dragon shall trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set his hand, him up on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him in honor. Him with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. May God bless us as we look at this passage of scripture this morning. We go to prayer. I'll continue to pray for the weeks. And I'm not sure if my she's not here today, but I'm sure that something has troubled her, arthritis and other things. Pray for Matt and Mary as well. They both have some ailments. Pray for Keith. He's on the mend. He's not talking much, which is uh, is pretty happy about for now. <laughs> that will change shortly, but everything looks okay for Keith, and uh, he'll be seeing the doctor in the future. Uh, continue pray for Dylan at school, and uh, pray for his encouragement and help down there. Uh, pray for Jared as he prepares to leave. Uh, he's here this Sunday, he'll be gone next Sunday, and maybe he'll be back the next Sunday, which is the dinner. And that will be his last Sunday with us. He's moving to Florida, and uh, if we let him, we might just lock him in here. But anyway, uh, pray for him, and uh, uh, pray that he finds a good church down there. Uh, there are a lot of churches down there, so you have to be kind of picky. And uh, continue on serving the Lord down there. Um, pray for Alan Janet and their family, and for Kathy and Richard, Paul, Carl and Paul and Denise, and... Uh, um, let's see if I got my other. What was her name that was that had the cancer out? Dolores. Dolores. That's it. Because I knew she here, and I didn't write her name down. So Dolores. We'll still pray for her. Uh, Chester and his ongoing needs, and uh, uh, Gerard and his uh, ongoing needs, of course. And for pray for my son-in-law Billy. Uh, Bill, he's uh, headed south tomorrow to Uruguay for 10 days on a mission trip. He's basically taking his uh, expertise down there, uh, wiring and such. That's what you're doing, right, Bill? Wiring. They don't have electricity yet, but he's gonna do all the wiring, you know? And, no, I'm only kidding. And uh, uh, pray for his safety. And uh, his family is gonna be with us for a couple days anyway, right? So pray for us as well. <laughs> All right, pray for Miriam. Uh, she's going to be here at the end of the month, um, the 20th, I think. Did I pick her up, right? 26. 26th. And uh, pray for Ronnie as well. And uh, for Stefan and Rebecca. I think they'll be coming from Utica area by now, and they'll be with us for that, sun that Sunday. And Jonathan and his uh, fiance are getting married the 3rd of November, so we can pray for them. Traveling mercies for the father and mother, etc. Anybody have a prayer request? Janet? And he's still growing, or that they took him to the pump? So he's still growing. All right. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come. We're thankful, Father, that we have the freedom. We uh, pray, Lord, now for Israel and uh, 
all that is transpiring over there. And we know, Father, that your your will be done. Father, you're sovereign, and we we are expecting these things to happen because even our Savior said there'll be wars and rumors of wars, etc. But certainly, it, when it has something to do with Israel, we perk up our ears, hoping that maybe we're getting to the point where you're going to take us home. But we pray for the Christians that are over there and all the rest of the people, Father, and that you would just be with them. We pray, Father, for uh, Louise, and we pray for her health and um, all the things that she's going through with the loss of her husband. We pray for uh, Gerard and uh, his health needs and for Dylan in school, and pray for him and uh, his walk down there, that uh, he would seek uh, help from the pastors down there. Pray for Jared as he uh, does these moves and uh, moves to Florida, and that you would continue to bless him, give him safety on the roads, and we pray for uh, uh, Al Jan's family, and for um, uh, Carl especially, and uh, that you would uh, be with the nurses and doctors, that they can help him with this, this fever might not get out of hand, for Kathy and Richard, and for uh, Paul and Denise, for Matt and Mary, and for their family uh, and their grandson that's having trouble, Sue's uh, child, and pray for Keith and Elaine, and uh, thankful that Keith made it to the surgery and uh, that his voice will return, we pray for Elaine as she meets for the doctor the final time and uh, has a straight leg, and uh, pray for her back as well, pray for Chester, his, uh, his health needs, and uh, for Miriam as she travels up from South America, and for Ronnie as well, and for missionaries, uh, Stefan and Rebecca, and uh, we pray for Jonathan and his fiance as well. We're thankful for the few moments we have in time now in your presence, Father, as we embrace your word. We just pray for guidance and direction and application, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, one more hymn together. Uh, his way with thee, 507.
Bibles, turn to Psalm 51. This is the second part. Hopefully, I'll finish it up today. If I remember from last week, one of the things that I mentioned about the psalm was that it was set up in three persons. Uh, first person is the first three verses, and then verses three to um, Thirteen, I think, are in the second person, and then the last part is actually God speaking. And so, uh, if you do some research on Psalm 91, you'll find that um, a lot of people have put a lot of interesting information about the use of Psalm 91. It's a meditative psalm. It's a psalm that gives us encouragement. And uh, to the point where some people are suggesting that you uh, read the psalm out loud and hope that something happens great for you. I'm not sure if that's what it was designed for. I personally believe, like some others, that Moses might have penned this because of the correlation between Psalm 90 and 91, although there's some Davidic evidence as well. So either way, I think that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit so we can settle on that. Uh, when we looked last week, what we actually did was to, to consider... And I'll just, um, the protection, the comfort, and the care of Yahweh. That was the first two verses. He that dwelleth in the secret place. Now, Spurgeon believes that the use of the word secret implies a personal, individual connection with God. Not someone that claims to be in the center of God's will, but someone actively living in that sacred place in life. So the potential of being in this secret place is a reality for the believer. It all has to do with surrendering. All has to do with relying upon God. And what the author says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, and the Most High really is an interesting phrase. I think he gave you the words that were used there. And, uh, but Most High implies the idea that there's no one higher than God. So if you're looking for the safest place to be, that would be in the center of God's will, because no one supersedes God, and shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now that's an interesting reference, especially if you understand the perils of living in the desert. And the story that comes to mind is a fellow named Jonah. And Jonah went to Nineveh, you know, he drug his feet, didn't want to see God spare these wicked people. But when he was up outside the city, he was like, okay, I'm going to watch and see what happens here. God allowed this gourd to grow. And because of the harshness of the, the uh, desert and heat, God gave him some natural shade. That's that idea of shade. Uh, something that God provides for us, even though despite of where we are, we still have the benefit of his presence. Now, of course, that illustration falls apart because of Job's... Um, Jonah's stupidity and uh, crying about, well, the gourd died, so he wanted to die. Um, so that, that's as far as that goes. But the understanding, though, is that uh, where we are, we're benefiting from his presence. And I think I mentioned last week, uh, to benefit from someone's shadow, you have to be pretty close. Unless he's a giant, of course. But, you know, to be where you can be protected from the difficulties of life. The metaphor here, of course, is obvious. And uh, then the second part was that uh, the author in his first person says, you know, I'll say of the Lord, uh, he's my refuge and my fortress. Uh, refuge can be translated shelter. So we understand what that means. For example, when you're in down in the south and there's a tornado, they always tell you to take shelter. Matter of fact, that phrase was used a lot during the pandemic, you know, sheltering in your house, hiding from this. Uh, pestilence. And uh, obviously, this psalm is just that good of a psalm for the application for our experience as well. Now, COVID wasn't necessarily the bubonic plague, but it certainly was something that was widespread and caused a lot of fear. And uh, for the believer, uh, this can really kind of encourage us and help us. Spurgeon will tell us that uh, the implication isn't that if we are one of God's children, he'll totally spare us from heartache and the phrases from evil. 
Uh, that's not what it's implying. But there is this element that God is, that can spare us. Everybody that's here today, we survived. And most of us caught it in some way, you know. And there were other people that passed away. Now, it could have been worse if it was a worse thing. And, uh, um, you know, it's just one of those things. What I'm saying is the psalm isn't implying that as believers we're invincible and we'll never get sick and we'll never die. Obviously, that's not what it's saying. And what it is saying, though, is I have the confidence in God not to be scared of anything. Because anything that happens to me, God allows, and I want to be in his will, whether it's good or bad, on the outside. So really it frees me from the fear of these things and uh, COVID or whatever else comes down the road. And so that's what the author did in the first two verses, from his perspective, right? Then he changes gears, and this is what we're going to look at today, and hopefully the rest of it. We, we talked about the protection and comfort of being in his presence, but there's more than that, because what we want to look at is how God brings his protection and comfort and his care to us. So now, from verses 3 and 4, we have the second person perspective, and uh, he says, surely... Uh, certainly he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Now, now the author again um, uh, utilizes metaphors, which is a common thing in our lives as well. Sometimes we use descriptive stories to, to get our point across, especially with children. We understand that the metaphor helps them to picture something, and then you come home with the point, and this is what the author does. So he describes the difficulties of life, like uh, the hunter, and you're the prey. He says, uh, he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And then he adds something, and then from the noisome pestilence or the destructive plague. Now, over the history of mankind, there have been several plagues that have wiped out literally thousands and millions of people, uh, especially... Uh, from our history, well, not our history, but from our understanding from the Middle Ages, the bubonic plague, which was caused by fleas from rats in England and other places, wiped out thousands of people, um, and uh, there was no cure for it. I'm not even sure if there's a cure now for the bubonic plague, but I don't think we've heard of it that much anymore. I'm sure we have some kind of shots for it, but anyway. But regardless of how our medic medicine has progressed over the years, there's always that threat of something coming down the pike. Whether it's, now you can classify this as the fowler is either Satan, the system, your old nature, but what the fowler will do is set a snare. Now, uh, when I was younger, my brother and I used to set traps uh, to catch mink and uh, most times we cut skunks, but you know, uh, we were trying to, my brother was good at tanning and there was a market for fur back then. And, but you had to set snares and traps because animals aren't stupid. You know, they'll see something and smell something and walk away if there's some chance that they might get hurt by them. It's all instinct. Uh, so this is what this, uh, the fowler would do. Now, I, I broke it down into four things. Uh, first, he works in secret. Um, the attack, spiritually especially, might not necessarily be right in your face. And uh, the, uh, the, the trap will be something that is subtle enough that you might not necessarily recognize it until it's too late. Too late. That's what he's talking about here. The fowler changes the trap of methods. Uh, the fowler also, also entices with pleasure and profit. Uh, to catch a mink, you've got to give him something to eat. Well, matter of fact, any animal you try to catch in a trap, there has to be what we would classify as bait, you know. And uh, so, uh, in reality, in our own lives, a lot of times when we fall into a trap, we're baited by something. Uh, people will say, listen, if you invest this money, you're guaranteed to make a million dollars. I just want to listen to Elon uh, Musk, his name is, and he has a program. And if you don't make a million dollars in three months, he'll give you one of his battery-operated cars. You know, it's like, okay. Of course, they don't show the small print in there, but um, whatever scheme he has, it, you can make $3 million or a $1 million. And so these are the types of traps that people fall into. Now, 
For the believer, what we're looking at is the traps that will cause us to be rendered ineffective. Satan certainly can't take your salvation, but he certainly can shipwreck you, uh, fall into some kind of sin or something along those lines. And so uh, the, the best prey are the animals or the uh, ones that are aware of the traps and the survival longest. And uh, so uh, the metaphor can, you have to be careful that you don't fall outside of the parameters of Scripture because the metaphors can be blood, a bunch. But uh, what we're looking at here, the author, he's uh, describing uh, this idea that not just the trap, but the, the things that naturally happen, or not naturally, a pestilence. And we, we would classify that today as the things that we have experienced thus far. And uh, um, verse 4 says, he, he shall cover thee with his feathers. Now, we're understanding this from the how-to. And uh, the author now is describing another metaphor of an eagle or a chicken and the chicks. And we've already talked about that last week, about what Jesus said about Jerusalem. And uh, what we understand is security of under his wings shall thou trust, and his truth shall be the shield and buckler. So we have two promises from this passage that are applicable to us. One is that uh, uh, because of his presence, there'll be that element of trust, or you could say confidence, or um, I'm not sure exactly a better way of saying this. Um, there'll be satisfaction, there'll be confidence, there'll be uh, joy, there'll be uh, a lack of concern, I guess is the best way to look at it. So um, that's one. And then his truth shall be a shield and buckler. We know from Ephesians that Paul uses this metaphor and imagery of the Roman soldier and the shield of faith. And uh, so we have an idea of the application for us as well that he provides for us uh, in this difficult place that we live in with the potentials of all sorts of things happening to us spiritually and physically. Thou shalt not be afraid. So here's that third thing that I think results from this. When you have confidence in God, when you are sure of his sovereignty, there'll be a, a lessening of the fear of the unknown. Why? Well, because God is in complete control. It's like our little kids, my granddaughter Leah there. She's not sitting there fiddling her thumbs worrying about gas pricing or how much a loaf of bread costs and will we have enough money to pay our bills because she has total trust in mom and dad. Now, mom and dad might have to experience this and put their trust in God as well, which I'm pretty sure they're doing. And this is what we do as believers. There are a lot of unknown things that could happen. But we have some rock that we can stand on, that we can trust when the storms come our way. This psalm is perfect for any culture that has this kind of um, understanding about the future and the trepidation of what's happening in Israel, of course. Uh, Moses in 90 goes back to when they were wandering and his experience of burying millions of people and how that affected him and how that response he responded as he shared the joy of his presence, the description we have here of understanding how a little chick feels when mama's got him around the feather, you know, the wings protecting them and, uh, you know, making that transference to our understanding of how God is. God is not some distant something out there. I've heard people call him the man up in the sky and, uh, that intelligent being. He's a loving father. That's how he portrays himself in scripture. A loving father is there for you, will discipline you when you're bad, but loves you no matter what, and will do whatever it takes to bring you along the way. That's the father as well. So a lot of times when we have difficulties in life, some people go that route. Why does God hate me now? Why did God allow this to happen? Instead of thinking, what can I learn from this and what is God trying to tell me uh, in this event that's transpiring in my life? Uh, certainly Moses would be a, 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 the top of the list as far as a candidate who experienced the downfalls of life 
and the discouragement of those old people. Uh, you know, when he came down from the mountain, he was glowing, literally. But I imagine inside as well, having the commandments of God in his hand. And when he got down close enough, he saw the people living like pagans and running around, dancing around a golden calf. You know, the discouragement that he faced off. Sometimes you don't see that reflected in the scripture unless you read between the lines or you assume, uh, based on be just being human, that he probably would have went that route. The psalmist inspired by the Holy Spirit did not intend, and I wanted to read this for you because uh, this absolute promise, absolute is the word that I was focusing on, that every believer would be delivered from every snare or every pestilence. Instead, the idea is the psalmist could point to many times when God did just that uh, uh, for his trusting people. Doesn't mean that those who trust God never die from infectious diseases or suffer from enemies' plots, of course. It means that those who trust God are habitually and delivered from these dangers. This is Montgomery Boyce. I think he was a Presbyterian. Uh, he's long dead. Uh, but he had a lot, a lot of good things to say in some of his books. He said, What Christians cannot testify, or what Christian cannot testify to many such deliverances. Now, in this passage, there's a messianic piece. Um, and I think I mentioned last week about the, we're going to hit this today, but I'll just mention it now, uh, that uh, it's quoted from Matthew, where the angels will be with Christ and won't allow him to stub his toe on rocks and stuff like that. And from that, people are springboarded and all sorts of guardian angel things and all that stuff. Uh, the passage does imply that not just one individual, but all angels are messengers of God, and God employs them in different ways to intervene, interact and intervene for us. Now, this is getting a little off topic, but I think it's something to think about. You can go back in life and you can say, well, I remember the one time I just missed getting in a car accident, or I was delayed, and because of that delay, I wasn't in this event. And uh, you have a choice. You can think, well, that just happened. It's the way life is. Or you can think, God intervened in some way. And I, I kind of lean that way because in my understanding of sovereignty, God is in complete control of everything. And so I can trust him. And when I have a flat tire, I deal with it. You know, I'm not happy. Um, usually it's, I remember going up to Christina's the one time and on the on the Hutchinson, I blew a tire. It wasn't bad enough that I blew a tire, it was brand new. And when I took it to the shop upstairs, the guy says, I can't fix it, it had a hole like this in it. What was lodged in it was a weight from a car, a wheel fell off and stuck in the tire. But I changed the tire in the rain and in the dark. So I wasn't that happy, you know? I wasn't like, praise God for the flat tire, thank you for this experience. But Afterwards, I was praising him as I was driving up. One, that I'd make it because it was on a donut because it was only supposed to go 50 miles and it was 100 some miles. Two, that I wasn't in an accident because of the rain, etc. So uh, every time you look at something, my grandma used to always say, and you probably have heard this old idiom, there's always a silver lining. You know, and it's true. Uh, the pessimists will always look for the worst. Uh, and I tend toward that route of life, but I've learned over the years that uh, whenever something bad happens, God always has something good for his children, and uh, there's an opportunity for us. So, th the spiritual understanding or application of this really is, and uh, I couldn't say it any better than, uh, McLaren is a Scottish uh, preacher from the 1900s, he's long dead, and I wish I could say it the way he did. I listened to a, a scratching tape that somebody had recorded him, but he said this, the mother eagle spreading her wing over her eaglets is a wonderful symbol of the union of power and gentleness of God. So keep that in mind. Uh, God is all powerful, but he has the ability to have the gentleness enough to nurture us. And I think it's good. Martin Luther said this, it is faith which maketh thee the little children, and Christ the hen, that thou mayest hide and hope and hover and cover under his wings, for there is health in his wings. Now that was uh, Martin Luther, but
but the guy named Trapp was the one who quoted it, so I give both of them the credit. So let's move on from there, because uh, not only the how that God does this, but the results of it. A lot of times when good things happen, there's a result, you know. You come to my house, and it's your birthday, and I hand you the keys to a brand new something. You're not going to cry. You might be crying in joy, but there's happiness. There's a result. Otherwise, you know, you open the letter, and the IRS says you owe us $1,000, and you might have the opposite of a smile, and tears as well, you know. So there's always a response emotionally when things go on. And what I look at in verse 5 and 6 is the results of God's protection. Two things, I think, that are uh, evident is... Um, he says, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror of night. You don't need to fear the things that go bump in the night. And now you can take that idea of the darkness and apply it this way. The unknown. You don't have to fear the unknown. It's basically what it means. Uh, the things you can't see, the things you can't imagine the things that you can't anticipate because you rest in the hands of the sovereign God, that fear is eradicated. So that's a benefit from uh, trusting him, from being under his wings. And uh, the second thing is the obvious of it. He, he uses this phrase, um, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Those things that are apparent, those things that are out there now, uh, that uh, that could conjure up fear. You know, COVID's coming down the street. You know, it's spreading through Huntington. It's coming our way. And everybody's putting sandbags out or something. I don't know. But, you know, we're preparing for this thing. Even those things, we can ultimately trust God uh, one way or the other. See, the, the thing that I think Spurgeon was trying to bring out was that uh, there's always a chance that you can go too far. And uh, that's what I think I see on YouTube. They're making Psalm 91's promises kind of like a mantra. If you say this 10 times, it's almost like wearing a St. Christopher's medal. You'll be protected. That's not what the author is saying at all. And the Bible bears that up, that uh, um, trusting God doesn't guarantee that you'll never be sick, never get in an accident, never have a problem. That's not what it's talking about. What it does guarantee you that you'll never have the fear that others have to have the hope. Even at your deathbed, one day I might be sitting next to you in your last moments. As a believer, you won't have the fear. The Bible reassures us uh, God has taken the sting of death away. Usually, you know, when I was a kid, the one thing I hated was shots, the needle, right? Even as an adult, I used to try to scheme, try to get away from getting around shots in the Air Force. And we were getting shots all the time. They don't even tell us what it is. Who knows what they were shooting us up with? But over the years, I've learned that, you know, if it's done correctly, you don't even feel it. I have shots all the time with the VA. I'm not even afraid anymore because I know that it's not going to hurt. And for the believer... To know that God has taken that element of unknown away from you from death. Because what does Paul say? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. There you go, right there. There's no limbo. There's no, uh, am I going to wake up in the darkness? Am I going to be, you know, you're going to be in present with the Savior. And that's a promise that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, shares with us. So, now, let me be honest with you. Um, there's always going to be an element of unsureness. I guess that's a nice way of saying it. When things go wrong at first, you're going to question things, especially when something terrible happens. You know. But as you allow the Spirit to minister to you and you embrace the Word of God, God will give us grace to be able to handle these things. So, um, what I'm trying to uh, trying to avoid is the impression that, you know, if you just embrace all this stuff, you'll be like a rock, solid rock. And you'll never cry. You'll like, I'm okay to die. And, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, I'm a coward at best. I don't, I don't really want to die. I don't want to get hurt. I don't, I don't even go to the dentist because I'm scared to death, to be honest with you. But uh, 
if and when that happens, I'm sure God's going to be grace and Margaret will have me by the back of the neck. Thinking about that. All right, let's let's go on from there because of, uh, we, I don't want to uh, just spin my wheels here. Uh, the results of God's protection are those two things. Now, from that, obviously, verse 7 and 8, there's assurance there. Um, and, and he uses this phraseology that I've, I've heard quoted a few times. A thousand shall fall by thy side. Okay. And a ten thousand on your right side, but it shall not come to thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Certainly, you'll see with your own eyes, you'll see the wicked pay back. Uh, the, this element that uh, this, uh, the author is using here, uh, the psalmist describes how God's protection could conquer any odds or probabilities. God's protection and care could be so specifically focused that it can preserve one in 10,000. So that's, that's the possibility there. Uh, whether it's true or not to you, really is regardless. Uh, God has a time and a place and that moment when he calls you home based on what Jesus told his disciples, I go away to prepare a place for you. When it's finished, I'll come back for you. Now, you could be uh, naive and think, well, that was just for the guys that were there. Obviously, it, it, the implication is for us as believers that he's preparing a place for us. So the timing that God has is precise and it is something that we can trust. And as you embrace the scriptures, you'll see that timing all through scriptures. Everything happened at the very moment. Jesus was born in Bethlehem at that very moment. The wise men came at that very moment. Everything is in timing. So nothing has really changed for us as believers. So uh, we can expect, if it's his will, to survive or to perish. Now Spurgeon said this. It's really interesting. He says... It is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten his reward. See, you hear what he said? Nothing's going to happen to you outside of God's will. And if it does, actually he's hastened you to be in his presence. For the believer, uh, I had a friend in my first church. He was kind of eccentric, but had a lot of wisdom. And uh, he, he died, and his request was that he be buried in a graduation gown because he was graduating to glory. I was at the, at the funeral because we were in Mayfield, I think, at that time. But uh, those that had been there thought it was quite unique and kind of with his character. But uh, his concept of Going to heaven was a graduation. And when you would think about it, that's exactly what we are. We're in this life now. This is all we know is our reality. Well, it's really, uh, and using the phrase from computers, a precursor to what life is really going to be that life. Say you live 90 years. What's 90 years in line with forever? We're just a vapor, the Bible says, and we're gone. And uh, so uh, that's why Jesus says for us to store a treasure in heaven. Why not? That's where we're headed. This is just a temporary place. The gloom and doomers, the uh, environmental people that are saying that we're destroying the earth and, you know, all that stuff. And uh, they have it right. This earth will be burned up one day, but it won't be from us. It'll be from God. I personally believe that the elements that God has provided mankind are there for us to use until it's time for us to go. So I don't think we're going to run out of anything. This is kind of just a ploy to control people, this environmental thing. And if you dig deep enough in those that are leaders of this environmental movement and look at their own personal lives, you know, they're worried about the economy. They want you to ride the bus, but they're coming to your town on their private jet. You know, and coming in with a limo that's not run on electricity. So anyway, um, not to get political, right, for those of you that will comment. Um, he also mentions the idea that nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That was that passage there. Um, 
There was a guy named, uh, well, not sure what his name was now. Matter of fact, I left it out. 1854. Matt would like this because he's a history buff. When I had, uh, uh, this fellow says, um, and this was recorded by Spurgeon as well. Uh, he was in London for 12 months and uh, they had an outbreak of Asiatic cholera. And uh, that, that cholera was a terrible thing back then and people died. And uh, uh, he said, my congregation suffered from its inroads, this pastor. Family after family summoned me to the graveyards of the people that were dying. And just to make a long story short, because I got more things to share with you, um, he was going to go out into the country until he heard one of his parishioners say, oh, maybe God only protects us in the country. And so he decided that he was going to stay in London and minister to the folks. And what Spurgeon basically said was that uh, he exposed himself many times to this cholera and never got it himself as an example of someone that God was using and survived the plague. Now, I'm not sure if that's significant because God could allow him to catch it and die as well, and that would still been within God's will. And uh, let's, let's move into the Messianic portion here just for a second and uh, I'll try to share with you the application. Um, it says, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high of thy heaven, there shall no evil shall befall thee, verse 10. Neither shall any plague come near. For he shall, and this is the verse that Satan mistranslates or misuses in the New Testament, shall give the angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon a lion and an adder, and a young lion and a dragon, thou shalt trample on his feet. This uh, dragon is another uh, way of translating serpent or snake. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Now, the direct application can be messianic, and obviously it was uh, something that Jesus, uh, you know, we, we see in Matthew, especially during the temptation. Uh, but I think there's the application for us as well. I believe that God employs his angels in some ways to uh, help us along the way, perhaps to protect us, etc. My own experience was I was driving to work in Pennsylvania in the wintertime, I lost control of my car, I was spinning around like this. And as I was spinning, when I came this way, I saw a plow truck coming, and I, I spin it around on the ice, going down the hill. And just at the last moment, I spun around and hit the snowbank and straightened out and I went down the truck. I couldn't stop and he didn't look like he was going to stop. And all along, my hands are going like this, counter steering. And I don't know what I was doing. And I thought about it when I got to work and thought, I wonder if there was an angel actually steered for me. Now, that's just my experience and don't, don't misunderstand that. But the reality is that God's servants help and do things to complete God's will and uh, you know so uh, the first application of course is messianic and then we can look at it that way as well now when I was in Bible college I had a professor say you know don't go too far with this angel thing because you only can go within the realms of scripture and uh, there's a chance you can uh, lose your focus on Christ uh, and anytime you see an angel that had an appearance with humans and the humans bowed down, the angel told them to stand up, I'm just a fellow servant like you. Now they're different than us, they were created and they're angelic, but obviously we're not meant to worship them and to focus on them as well. So uh, the last part of this um, psalm, we go from the second person to the last three verses, 14, 15, 16, to God actually speaking. So the author, um, inspired with the Holy Spirit, utilizes this device, he says, because he hath set his love upon me. Now, whether you are looking at it from a messianic point, saying obviously this connection between Christ and God the Father, God the Son connection, you can, but I think that the, the author's intent was that we understand that because God, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Uh, I think there's seven things that I found out of this. Actually, Jonathan down this morning, and uh, or I'm just have to remember. I just 
Now here they are. That I think will help us kind of flesh out this last two verses. Uh, let me read them for you. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Uh, he shall call upon me and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble, deliver him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, so what I did was I saw some things there that go back and forth. It says he'll set his love, that's set his love upon me. Uh, and then because of that, I will deliver him. So there's one promise, uh, two sides of it. Uh, benefits from uh, being in the center of God's will. Then he sets him on high uh, because he knows his name. That simply means that because of our relationship with Christ and God, we know him and he knows us. And then he'll place us in a place of protection or place us in a place of peril, but in the center of God's will. So you can look at on high two different ways. But uh, God wants us and has a plan for each one of us, and he wants us to be in the center of that. And with that confidence, we can serve no matter how bad it gets. Uh, he'll, we, he'll call upon him. We'll call on him, and he will answer us. And uh, I'll be with him and deliver him and honor him. We have his promise of his presence. And not only that, he'll be with us every step of the way. And then the last part, I think, is the... Um, Say this, but the pièce de the resistance, the best part of it, is uh, he will show me my salvation. Uh, he will let me see my salvation. And uh, obviously, as believers, the Spirit reveals to us from His Word uh, the whole uh, the whole gamut of salvation, from uh, confession of sin, repentance, down to uh, being adopted in His family. So that's a privilege that we have. So Psalm 91, in a nutshell, really is a beautiful song to give us encouragement, but make us aware that um, there's always an opportunity, there's always a chance that something could happen. But if that does happen, that doesn't nullify his presence or his love for us. And that, uh, if anything, he's speeding us along the way to be eventually in his presence. And... Uh, don't think of that in any morbid tone, but obviously as believers, the one thing we really want to be is in his presence. Be away from the sin and the aches and the pains and all the other things that life gives us here and be with him. And uh, so uh, what am I saying for us to do? Well, one is to trust him totally. Totally means to that totally affects our actually walk daily. Because of him, my language, my thoughts, all are focused on trusting and honoring him and glorifying him. And uh, what Paul talks about, this warfare becomes a reality because when you decide to serve God, when you want to prove that, when you want to grow closer to him, be sure you're going to have opposition. Want to study for 15 minutes? The phone's going to ring, uh, or it's going to be inconvenient. And so, uh, anything that's going to be good for you spiritually is going to be not just work, but you're going to have to commit to it and sacrifice things that might not that might be difficult to sacrifice. But that's the goal of the believer to go beyond just claiming to be a believer and being in his presence to actually being in his presence and experiencing that uh, freedom, uh, that joy that he has for us. Uh, so that's how I'm going to Let's have a word of prayer together. For, we're thankful, Father, for the psalm. We're thankful that you have uh, loved us and provided redemption for us, giving us a purpose in life. Not just that, but giving us assurances and giving us uh, your word so that we can grow closer to you uh, and uh, to have that confidence to just uh, go and trust and uh, serve you and not worry about what's going to could happen we're thankful for that we're thankful father for this day and for all the folks that are here today we pray for those that couldn't make it today lord that you would 
Bring them back next week, Father. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn together. Um, James, you bring out the prayer. Thank you.